This is James Shulk, I'm host of Web Comics Reviews and Interviews. Today we're with comicer Ben Dunn. So sit back, relax, and let the Geek Fest begin. Hi, how you doing? My name is Ben Dunn, and uh, I'm happy to be here. Well, let's see. Uh, I uh, immigrated here from Taiwan when I was about a year old. Uh, I most I grew up here, so uh, and. Uh, in 1985, I started Antarctic Press, and it's still going on even today. And I also have created uh, uh, such comics as Ninja High School and Warrior Nun. And we'll probably end up talking a little bit, I'm enough of a movie geek that we'll probably end up definitely talking about that situation. <laughs> no problem. Um, real quick, what's the, or why did you call your uh, press Antarctic? Well, originally, uh, I was in partner. I had a business partner, and we were trying to think of a name for our comic company. And we were originally going to call our comic company Penguin Press. But we found out there was already a Penguin Press. So we decided, well, where do penguins live? In the Antarctic. So we just said, there you go. That's the name of our new company, Antarctic Press. Okay. I know Antarctic does a lot of interesting comics. Uh, obviously, you know, Ginger High School is one of them. Gold Digger, another, and so on and so forth. Um, I'm more interested in your uh, anthologies. All right. Um, how many, what would you like to know? First off, how many do you have going? Because it seems like you have like four or five at least. Well, I, I've always been a firm believer in anthologies. I think it's one of the ways to uh, try out a lot of different ideas in a small package. In fact, the Antarctic Press' very first comic book it ever did was an anthology called Mangazine. And uh, I believe that's the first time anyone ever used the word manga uh, in, the, in the title of a comic book. And uh, I like the anthology format because it allows me to work with a lot of different writers and artists and creators and debut as many uh, stories you know, that we can possibly fit in one comic. You know, so and I also think that the uh, anthology is the kind of uh, uh, form, comic form that uh, hasn't seen much love recently, and I'm definitely trying to bring that back, so that uh, we can give people a lot of variety. It's like the variety show of the comic book set, basically. Yeah, I mean, I know that DC always seems to have his puts out his digest, but there's no real, but it's almost always reprints. There's no real. Um, actual new material in a lot of comic book anthologies of late, so. And yeah, and they're also superhero focused, you know, I mean, it used to be when DC back in the day uh, would come out with digests, they would also do romance digests and uh, western digests and war digests, but, uh, you know, it's, it'd be hard pressed for anyone to uh, 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 say what Marvel and DC has done besides just superheroes nowadays, you know. A lot of people don't understand the rich, uh, don't realize the rich history that both those companies had done as far as different subject matters. They weren't always, always about superheroes. Yeah, especially after the dreaded comic book die-up of 1955. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's when things really started to change, wasn't it? Uh, you know, the dreaded seduction of the innocent released and then all the... Uh, Feedback, uh, back, uh, feedback from that. So, well, you know, they were put in a tough position. You have to realize that uh, uh, the uh, subject matter was definitely getting to the point where it was becoming less kids' fair and more adult fair. You know, which there's nothing wrong, with, you know, in, in 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 you know theory. But parents like when video games were doing a problem, like the movies have ratings now. You know, parents have a hard time, you know, this, uh, deciding what to give. You know their children, as far as the entertainment is concerned. The problem was, I think the comic industry went too far. You know, they uh, uh, decided that all comics had to have that uh, stamp of approval. So therefore, it, it didn't allow for comics to grow as a medium beyond uh, just the targeted, you know, kids' fair. And that's that's where the problem lies. It didn't have it, basically the seduction of the innocent. They stunted the growth of comics into a medium that could be accepted by older readers. I mean, now uh, it, that's changed, of course, you know, with the demise of the comics code, uh, anybody 
uh, to do whatever they want as far as comics are concerned. But then uh, the readership for the kids' comics is definitely has dropped off. So that's what I'm afraid of, that we're losing a generation of, of, of comic readers because younger kids are not you know, reading comics anymore. Right. All right, so what anthologies does Antarctica currently put out? Well, currently we're putting out uh, Exciting Comics, which is our superhero anthology. Uh, we just released a horror comics, which is our, uh, of course, horror anthology. Um, and right now I'm working, and we also did Jungle Comics, which is more like adventure uh, in with a jungle theme anthology. And right now I'm working on a revival of uh, Planet Comics. And, uh, and 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 I'm, right now I'm also uh, researching uh, and the vi- researching the viability of bringing back crime comics and war comics, you know, as well. Because I believe that you have more variety for people to pick from, then I think you'll attract a wider audience. Okay. Um, what kind of stories are you looking for when it comes to the, the anthologies? I mean, oh. obviously not just the subject, the specific subject matter, but what kind of, like, what kind of writing, that kind of thing. Well, I, you know, as as far as the material is concerned, we try to set at least a minimum standard. You know, basically what it is is that if you turn something in, we look at it, you know, we decide the variability of it in terms of whether or not it's publishable. Sometimes we do get material that is not uh uh, is not professional or needs more work, you know. And so, uh, but a lot of times, as long as the book is, as long as the story is complete and meets our guidelines, you know, and is competently uh, written and drawn, you've got a very good chance of being accepted, you know, to be honest. You know, and, and that's the thing is that uh, when you're a small press, uh, you have a lot more freedom, you know, flexibility to accept material from people who are just starting out. And, you know, this way it gives them a chance, you know, to get their work out there, you know, without uh, a huge amount of risk, basically. Okay. Uh, what kind of things have caused stories to be rejected in the past? Oh, well, I mean, we've rejected <laughs> hundreds, you know, but we also accept lots, too, as well. I mean, uh, it's just a course of doing business, you're going to get material that isn't up to snuff yet. You know, I'd be loath to discourage anyone to give up, you know, whenever they send something in. You know, I try to point out areas that need to be improved, areas that they can work on, you know, and every, anybody who submitted other stuff rejected can always resubmit either new material or reworked material, you know, until it gets to the point where I am satisfied you know, with the viability right now. But that's, I'm speaking of me personally, so, you know, I can't really vouch for AP in general because uh, different editors have different standards, different levels, you know. But I, for the most part, uh, as long as it meets certain criteria, um, you know, you're pretty much uh, a shoe-in, to be honest. Okay. Uh, what's the, that criteria? Well, like I said, the criteria that I set is basically, does it appeal to me visually, you know, and does the story engage me, okay? If those two standards are met, then chances are very likely I'll probably accept it or find a place where I can uh, put it somewhere. You know, oftentimes, so even if I accept the story, it can take a while for it to actually see publication because we are a small company and we don't have a large uh, uh, space in the catalog. We can only offer so many titles a month you know, to make it viably, you know, uh, to make it viable as far as getting it out. But if you're patient, eventually it'll come out. Okay, I definitely wouldn't undersell the uh, Antarctica as a small press, but I mean, I know it is compared to some of the big ones, but it's definitely, not, I think, on the top third as far as the comic book companies go. Oh, well, you know, it, it is... Uh, uh, it is it is fact that AP is a, is still a very small company in comparison, you know, to the big two, uh, and uh, but you know I think uh, as we go along, 
you know, as we find more and more creators that will uh, connect with readers, you know, there's no reason why AP cannot grow, uh, you know, and, and, and compete with the big guys. You know, it doesn't take that much, really. You know, all it takes is, like, uh, uh, something really big to break out to uh, really put your company on the map, you know. It's, it's all about content. That's the, big, that's the most important thing. Um, would there be anything that basically up that uh, interest in you? For example, having a web comic follow or you know web comic following or anything like that online. Basically, would a popularity help? Um, I'll be honest. I don't know much about web comics. Uh, I've tried my hand at doing it, but it just I don't think it's me. You know, it, it, it it's something I would like to be more involved with, but I just don't have the demeanor or the time. You know, to spend on doing a web comic, you know, I, uh, I know some people like that medium, and that's perfectly fine. Uh, but I don't have that patience. Now I know some of the creators who do work for it do have their own web comics and stuff like that, and that's great because I think that's a fantastic way to get your stuff out there. And truth be told, if uh, the more people who see your stuff, the better. Okay. Yeah, I was curious if basically if I had uh, a huge web following would that influence the decision on being accepted in one of the anthologies or oh absolutely yeah if you have a following already for your material that does greatly affect the decision because a it shows that you have the professionalism to actually produce material and that's really 99 percent of the battle it's just getting something out you know and two if you have material that people actually like and read you know there's a great possibility that there's a crossover and that they'll also support a print version of your work you know and then uh, uh, also uh, if you are somebody who's done it for a while then obviously your stuff is going to get better and better you know as you go along you know and because the more you do something the better you'll become you know so uh, those factors greatly affect you know our decision now you know the only really only real criteria that we'd have to do is the subject matter. You know, is it appropriate for the audience we're trying to reach? You know, and uh, uh, you know what the creator wants in return. You know, if the if, if his demands are unreasonable, then of course we can't do anything about it. But if he comes to us and he likes our, uh, um, you know, likes our terms, then yeah, it's, it's it's you know not a not difficult decision at all. You know, to be honest. So what kind of rating, uh, as far as like movie rating, what kind of rating are you sh- trying to shoot for as far as your anthologies go for? Well, currently, uh, you know, I try not to censor my creators. Um, of course, we try to avoid, you know, material that we think is inappropriate, like, you know, uh, X or R, R, you know, and try to keep the language uh, to a, a minimum. You know, because uh, as, as far as I'm telling you, we're trying to reach as wide an audience as possible, and that may uh, uh, exclude younger readers if that kind of material is being presented. Now, that doesn't say that we don't do material that is more geared to older readers, and uh, we have done it before in the past. So, but those usually are handled as a separate series as opposed to being included in an anthology. Okay. Yeah, I'm trying to uh, make it a little bit easier as far as if I figure if I can be, have people know what the criteria is ahead of time, I might be able to make things a little bit easier on you just a little bit or harder depending, <laughs> on, how, depending on how you want to look at well, it. I appreciate it. I appreciate But, you know, it's mostly a case-by-case basis. You know, every individual creator is different. You know, so I I don't like to have a I, – I like to have at least a baseline as far as uh, – as far as accepting material is concerned. Um, but it really just comes down to, do I like it? If I like it, then, you know, then I'll accept it. If I don't like it, then I'll say why I didn't like it. And hopefully the creator will be able to take my advice, you know, and try to uh, approve upon that. You know, and because like I said, I do not want to discourage anyone, you know, from creating comics. I think it's a beautiful medium, and I just want people to do more of it, you know. But uh, and at the same time, I don't want to just simply out and out dismiss somebody's work because 
you know, he's not well known or he hasn't been in the business for a long time because uh, I believe if you try to destroy someone's passion too early, you know, and uh, it, it, it's, it's not a good thing. You know? So that's why I try to encourage people, even if I do reject their material, to keep at it, you know, and to try again. You know, sometimes it takes two or three, four. I mean, I, I'll give you an example. Fred Perry was rejected at least four or five times, you know, before we finally accepted a story from him. You know, right. and now he's like one of our longest running creators and doing a comic that's uh, been in his hands, you know, for over 20 years. Cool. And I guess the other fun question is, what happens if you have a situation where a piece of work would obviously fit into several different anthologies? Like, for example, a uh, I want to say the Dorsey, you're familiar with the Dorsey uh, series at all? Uh, books? Mm, no, I'm not familiar with that. Uh, basically, if it was a science fiction, a war story, how would it go? Okay. Well, I mean, if it was submitted to me and the art was decent and the story was great, you know, yeah, I, I probably would have no problem accepting it. I mean, we, is it basically, is it possible to submit the same story for different anthologies? Yeah, so, you know, of course, thematically, you know, I have to decide whether it fits in something like Planet Comics or exciting comics, or jungle comics, you know, or crime comics, or war comics, you know, the subject matter. Sometimes there's a mixed mashup between the two, you know, and I have to decide where it best fits. You know, but they're all open, you know, to do submissions, you know, and I'm more than happy, you know, to at least take a look at it and see if it's something, like I said, meets my criteria. Okay. And just to play around with the genres a little bit, uh, with Jungle Com Comics, how far are you willing to go for? I mean, obviously it's pu uh, pulp uh, set, in the, uh, set in the jungle. Yes, but it's not entirely. Uh, it's not entirely has to sit. sit in a, it can be a jungle on an alien planet. It could be a jungle, you know, uh, in a horror setting. It could be. It, the thing is, like I said, it has to fit uh, thematically. You know, my criteria, and if you know. For the most part, jungle comics is mostly an excuse to draw scantily clad men and women running around in a jungle setting. You know, it really comes down to whether or not the story is engaging and the characters are any good. You know, so basically you're not, uh, you're only limited by those two things, basically. So uh, other than that, I mean, I would just, you know, let your imagination run wild. Okay. Um, with war comics, would you be interested in doing stuff that's behind the scenes as far as the military goes, rather than just uh, the front lines? I, if it's has to do, if, are you talking about war comics? Yeah. Oh well, right now I'm in the middle of developing it. You know, sometimes. Uh, uh, but right now I'm open to ideas. I mean, I'm not opposed to uh, anything that might be military. I guess we're working. What I'm trying to stress is something that's more like. It fits within a military con context. So, but I'm not uh, opposed to somebody coming up with a story that uh, uh, you know is different, is new, and refreshing. So, you know, like I said, you guys just use your imagination. Okay. Yeah. What I was looking at is not just. I mean, when most people think war comics, uh, they think like Sergeant Rock, the Charlton War Comics, that sort of thing. Or sure. even, or even, and that would be the obvious thing to do. Yeah. But you know. Uh, war has been part of this planet's history throughout time. Yeah, when I was looking at when I was looking at the uh, some of the war comics, it was not necessarily going with straight front line stuff, but I was looking at stuff like uh, something said in a VA hospital or something like that. Sure, why not? Like I said, as long as the story is good and the art's good, I mean, I mean that's all that that's really all you need. So, um. So yeah, basically, again, where's the one you're just now developing? Yes, right now uh, it takes a long time to actually uh, come uh, to actually come up with the idea and finally get a book out. At least you know, for me it is because I gotta uh, decide uh, first. I gotta clear it with AP to see if they have room on their schedule for it. And once it gets approved, then I gotta, of course, get the call out for submissions and then I got to wait for the submissions and see what comes in and I have enough material to actually do an actual comic book. 
So it is a long process as far as anthologies are concerned. It's not like uh, if I just sit down and draw a comic, then I can just get it out at my own pace and schedule. Uh, because in anthology, it's more difficult to juggle a myriad of uh, creators, you know, and try to uh, get everything working, you know, like a like a machine. Because uh, any you know any any problem in that machine, then the whole thing can come derailed. So uh, that's why I try to create a, uh, a, a, a as big a catalog of material that I can so that the book will always be on time and that the book will come out. Right. And and just one last, obviously, hopefully not just one last question. And it's basically a 1 to 32 page length. I'm sorry? And the length of those is uh, somewhere between 1 to 32 pages? Uh, yes, it can change depending on how much material. I've always been a firm believer the bigger the comic, the better. But uh, the standard right now is, of course, 32 pages, and that's the limit that AP has given to me. Now, sometimes they'll let me get away with a larger book uh, if uh, I have enough material for it. But for the most part, yeah, 32 pages is the standard. You know, that way we can get the book out uh, more often, and uh, I can build up a nice back catalog of material. So, like I said, it's to uh, prevent the book from ever being late. Uh, what's your preferred link? Um, well, I I think the standard third two pages is fine. I have no problem with that. You know, it did uh, right now. It seems like the standard is between twenty four and thirty two. So I like to give readers maximum value by using all thirty two pages, if at all possible. I'm surprised you. I'm seeing a lot of the twenty four pagers and all. So. Well, yeah, 24 pages, you know, if I was doing a regular comic book, I would probably do 24 pages, you know, because that way I can keep up, you know, with the demand of my time and uh, still come up with a good quality product. Um, it's not unusual for me to go beyond 24 pages, but I think 24 pages is at least a minimum for a uh, a pretty standard comic book. Right. Yeah, I've got a person right now who's uh, doing a lot of stuff in uh, the t 8 to 12 page range. So, Oh, yeah, there's no problem. 8 to 12 pages is fine. I mean, any number of pages you want to do, is, there's no, the minimum is one. <laughs> you got to do at least one page. <laughs> and, you know, you can do as many pages as your heart can tell, you know. It's just a matter of, uh, of being able to uh, present it in the format that's appropriate, you know, and right now the standard is 32 pages. It's not unusual to do 100 pages or even more, you know, but uh, you have to at least do a minimum of one, you know, otherwise you got nothing. Yeah. And, of course, if you want to do multiple, uh, basically if you wanted to do a small serial, would that be okay as well? Or Sure, it's not, a, it's not unusual for us to serialize a story. You know, if, uh, if it takes Let's say it takes 32 pages to tell a story. I can break those up into 8 to 12 page chapters and run them over the course of several issues. Hopefully, it'll be a, a more, an interesting enough of a story that it'll be a draw for people to want to pick up the book on a regular basis. Yeah. I mean, obviously, I'm concentrating on the anthologies because it's, I see it as a way to, for the, uh, let's just say, less experienced professionals to break in. Absolutely. I think it's a great way for not only uh, uh, starting creators, but it's also a great way for uh, established professionals to do a story that they don't want to commit a full book to. You know, it allows them to, uh, uh, you know, try out new material uh, and uh, also do things without a huge commitment on time. You know, so it, it's, it's a, to me, it's like the best of both worlds. Yeah, and you guys are really apparently having some fun with it. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I'm having a great amount of fun because, first of all, I'm meeting all sorts of new creators and new talent, you know, and I love doing that. I love meeting new creators and new talent, you know, and I love to create uh, relationships with, you know, people who, uh, you know, have, uh, I see have great potential, you know, great talent, you know, and a lot of them ended up being, you know, lifelong friends. And is there, have you had anybody move from the, doing the anthologies to doing an actual book for Antarctic yet? 
Oh, yeah. I mean, I can name cousins of people. I mean, Fred Perry is one of them. You know, um, you know Terry Moore, another one. He did just a couple of short stories for us. You know, I mean, the Dave Johnson got his start in Magazine. You know, Robert De Jesus, and uh, I mean, if you look through uh, our past catalog of creators, uh, uh, we've had a lot of people who went on to do bigger and better things. You know, and uh, it's 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 just a matter of whether or not. Uh, but you know, but they all have to start somewhere. And AP is, is just a, one of the you know, many small publishers that like to give creators an opportunity to break into the industry. Cool. And I guess going a little bit into the anarch history, just so I can rub this up to a different direction. Um, yeah, I've been, Kim, I've been playing around with, or aware of Antarctic all the way back to Ninja High, so. <laughs> That's a long time ago, 1987. Yep. In fact, I think somewhere around the room I actually have some of the original, some of the early up, uh, issues of that. <laughs> well, that's great. I'm glad that you were a, a reader of the book. I mean, obviously, Yanark definitely has a soft spot for, for manga. Oh, yes, absolutely. I love manga. You know, but I love comics in general, but I do love manga as well. So I was very, very keen on promoting it in the U.S., you know, once I got the opportunity to do so. Yeah. With, you know, with Ninja High, for example, not only did it start off with the playing around with a little bit with the old harem anime trope, which was sort of a <laughs> weird one. Uh-huh. Um, and also through, in some, you know, I mean, just out of curiosity, was there an actual reason for you to go with Jeremy as a non-hero, basically? Well, you know, what they say is that uh, oftentimes the characters you create are a reflection of your own, you know, personality, you know, and I uh, based a lot of uh, characters on people I know and on myself because uh, – best thing you can draw from from is your own personal experiences and, you know, things in your life. And I sort of looked at Ninja High School as sort of the fantasy world that I thought would be interesting to populate, you know, had, you know, or if, if I was living in that kind of world, you know. And uh, I wanted to, uh, uh, you know, basically just see where, what that, where that would take me. And, Originally, like I said, Ninja High School, well, not, Ninja High School was originally just supposed to be three issues. I didn't have any plans to go beyond, you know, three issues, you know, and uh, it turned out to be uh, uh, more popular than I thought. And so I went ahead and made it a continuing series. Yeah, Ninja High School definitely got some uh, iconic characters. I mean, not just between the two prince, uh, two princesses, Itchy Kun and Azrael, but also uh, some of the side characters like Ricky, his mom, King Terminator. <laughs> oh, that's, yeah. I mean, Ninja High School started off as like a parody book originally. You know, it was basically just, you know, taking uh, uh, things that were popular at the time and just making fun of them, you know. But I knew that uh, uh, a parody is unfortunately dates material very quickly. So I had to create a way of doing parody without dating the characters or the material. So I purposely took characters that I would have liked to have done, and but I made them their own uh, personality. You know, they weren't just simply, uh, uh, you know, crazy uh, parodies of the actual thing. I m decided that I was going to do parodies of them, but I was also going to give them their own personality and then break them out as characters, you know, uh, in of themselves. So that they can stand on their own, you know, and that's that's basically the way I approached, you know, the book, and I just wanted to have some fun with it, you know, try to promote uh, uh, manga as an art form, and uh, and basically just uh, uh, see where it would take me. Cool. Okay, I guess we will go after the elephant in the room. How, <laughs> okay. How much fun has it been uh, doing the Warrior Nun? Um, what was the question again? How much fun has it been do, uh, doing tr translating the Warrior Nun to movies? Oh, <laughs> well, it's a Netflix TV series, um, so it's not a movie yet. I hope it'll be one. I don't know. Maybe in the future there might be one. But right now it's a 10-episode series on Netflix that should come out uh, either in uh, late 2019 or early 2020. I'm not... Uh, uh, do not know the schedule, so I'm more or less guessing, you know, when it'll be out. But I do know 
that it is ten episodes, and that they've uh, f- they're filming uh, the series in Spain, and that uh, uh, they finish they finish wrapping uh, the uh, principal photography sometime in July. So uh, right now is the beginning of June, so they got basically two more months to wrap up the principal photography. And I assume that once it's done, it'll go into post, and then that'll be up to Netflix to decide when they're going to release it. How do you pronounce your name, just out of curiosity? Ben Dunn? No, not your name. Her oh. name. <laughs> Silly. Oh, her name. R-E-A-L-A. R-E-A-L-A. R-E-A-L-A? Uh-huh. Okay. I wasn't sure because some people... It's, yeah, look at my name is all I'm going to say. So... <laughs> Okay, and what challenges have you had trying to translate it? I mean, looking specifically at uh, going from a comic book format to a script to a film script, what, how much, how much, that, what kind of challenges did you face? Oh uh, well, I I am not involved at all in the script writing, so I have no idea. I do know people who do uh, uh, script writing and stuff, and it's totally different than doing a comic book script. Uh, but then I have no experience in writing scripts for uh, any other medium except for comics. Uh, so, I, and I'm not involved at all in the actual, uh, you know, uh, in the actual uh, writing of the series. Um, but I am told that they used my comics as a jumping off point for a lot of their stories. So, uh, so at least there's that. You know, how much they're going to use, I don't know, since I haven't read any of the scripts. I have no idea uh, what direction. I am getting little bits and pieces of what they are using and what they're not using and what they're changing, you know. But for the most part, I think they're going to remain pretty faithful to the at least the the intent and flavor of the original comic book series. Okay, is that have you enjoyed being basically not part of it? Because at that point, me not having to worry about what's changing, or have you been trying to get as much feedback into that as possible, or? Well, uh, for the most part, I mean, I've volunteered my services as far as giving them, uh, uh, you know, a, a feel and look at the character. But they, they, they have a pretty good grasp of things moving forward. So, you know, I trust them, you know, completely in terms of the, translating, you know, the comic book series onto a TV medium. You know, and of course, the two are totally different. It works in comics does not necessarily work in, in television or movies. So I understand completely if there were things that were in the comic that uh, needed to be changed because of the other medium. Uh, but uh, I was, uh, uh, I have every confidence that the series is going to, like I said, be uh, faithful to the original source material. And uh, uh, from what I've seen so far, I think that they are going to live up you know, to all my expectations. Cool. And for its worth, Dave, my understanding is that since you've been on the actual, backing up half a step, usually speaking, the director and uh, producer don't like having the person who did the original source material on the set. And so I think my understanding is you've actually been on the set. So uh, for its worth, see that as a compliment. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I was honored to be there, you know, and they invited me and my wife, uh, Rebecca, to the, to see the uh, shooting of the very first episode, you know, and uh, we were treated like royalty by them. And it, we were met all the cast, or at least most of the cast, and uh, I met the, the character who's going to be playing Warrior Nun. You know, we met the stunt people. We met the stunt coordinators. We met the special effects people. I mean, they, they were all incredibly nice and very passionate about the project. They did not look at this as just some fly-by-night production. They were they were putting in their all 100% into this project to make it, you know, possibly the best thing that they could possibly put out. And I feel I felt very confident, you know, that they were going to treat my source of care with not only respect, you know, but with a sense of fun, you know, and with a sense of uh, uh, real, you know, compassion, passion, you know, for the project. I guess the obligatory is you have uh, you looking at getting any other Antarctic properties into film, or? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the the, the mere fact that Warrior Nun, you know, has 
uh, coming to Netflix has definitely increased our visibility as far as other properties are concerned. Now, I can't say it. I'm not at liberty to say which ones they are, you know, because of, you know, uh, I'm under a uh, sort of, uh, what do you call, uh, non-disclosure uh, thing until it becomes official. But I will say that there are lots of AP properties being considered, you know, because of uh, the Warrior Done Netflix deal. You know, but once those are official, I'd be happy to talk about it all day long with you. <laughs> okay. All right. So, yeah. So basically, is any advice you'd give somebody trying to break into comics? The most important advice I can give to anyone is just to do it. Okay. Even if you don't think your material is up to snuff, okay, you don't quit. Okay. If you really want to make it a comic, you've got to produce material. The more material you do, not only the better you'll become, the better your chances of being accepted. You know, or being. Uh, and of course, if you don't want to go that route, you can always do it yourself. The beauty of uh, the way things are now is that you can do your own web comic. You can post your own comic online without any uh, oversight by anybody. And you can do crowdfunding to make money off your creation. If your creation attracts an audience, you'll make you know, money to uh, bring your creation to life. You know, so you're not limited by going to a publisher. You have the freedom to do whatever you want and have nobody tell you what to do. The only advantage a publisher really has, okay, is it does provide you uh, uh, access to other you know, distribution systems, you know, like in the comic stores. Uh, and there's nothing to say you can't print comics and sell direct to comic stores, you know, but it does, publishers basically do a lot of the legwork, you know, that you would obviously have to do yourself. So if you'd rather spend more time creating and let somebody else do all the legwork, then the publisher, you know, is what he does for you. Now, but if you're willing to put in the time and the effort and the work to do everything yourself, more power to you, you know. And if you do that, there's nothing to stop you from taking the same material and presenting it to us and, uh, you know, finding a second stream of revenue for, for, your, uh, for your material. Now, so that's the thing about it is that there's so many options now for creators that weren't available, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, just out of curiosity, what should be the what's the optimal? Um, how's what's the optimal way the partnership between a uh, publication house and an individual creator should be as far as like marketing that sort of thing? Well, what what was the? Uh, are you asking about the length of time between? What kind of rela the, the relationship? I'm looking more at the relationship <laughs> itself. If, if basically, to what degree should the creator keep a hand in the thing as far as like marketing that sort of thing? Well, it's, of course, we want the prom creator to promote their material any way they humanly can. You know, if you promote your material yourself, that only is going to translate in more people being curious about your work and supporting it. You know, if you do nothing, then you get back nothing. Okay, but if you do a lot of your own promotion, then uh, who knows how far that can take you. You know, so basically you have to... You know, understand your audience, understand, you know, yourself, you know, and try to uh, promote the material any way you can that's humanly possible. Now, a publisher can only do so much because we have limited resources. You know, you're the best salesman for your material, to be honest. You know, and if you uh, can help promote, you know, the sales of your book or your creation, then that only translates into more success for you. So basically, the creator still has to be in major force within. He just happens to use the uh, publisher as basically a toolkit. Yes, I mean the publisher is a conduit, basically. You know, unless there's an agreement between the publisher and the creator in which they both jointly share something. You know, the creator owns everything, so he has to promote his material the best way he can. You know, so that more people will, you know, buy his product. You know, and uh, the publisher, like I said, does the legwork, but you have to be the face of the creation. So, you know, the, 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 like I said, the publisher can only do so much, and it's up to the creator, really, because you know, the publisher is trying to balance a lot of other creators, you know, and of course, 
uh, if the creator uh, does something that does really well for the company, the company is going to put you know resources behind it. But also at the same time, it wants to promote new material so that you know uh, it can also get other folks to sell uh, as well as well. So uh, it's just a matter of you as the creator to take it beyond uh, what is uh, necessary, the bare minimum, so that you can maximize your sales potential. Okay. Yeah, I guess the other fun question, just be, I know I have to get away from this theme, is, um, yeah, my team for the last couple of last couple of weeks has been fans. Go figure. Uh, to what degree should a fan have feedback into the particular comic? I know comics are a lot different than, say, movies or books where it's an ongoing art form rather than a, you know, once you're done, you're done type of deal. Should the fans have some well, sort of say or... Sure, absolutely. The fan is the most important. The readers are our most important, you know, asset. Without them, there would be no business. You know, we have to have uh, readers for us to stay in business, you know, and reader feedback is very important to us. We, uh, uh, I read every single letter I get, you know, I read every single email I get. I try to uh, reply when I can, you know, and I try to respond uh, to, of course, you know, there's only a certain amount of time a day, and I do have other tasks I have to accomplish. But I tried not to. Uh, uh, I tried to uh, give them a sense of importance that they have, they, that they are important to us. You know, and we try to emphasize that whenever we can and get them involved. You know, because we want them. You know, it's it's far easier to keep a customer than to try to win them back. So we try to make sure that they're happy, you know, in any way we can, you know, and listen to their concerns, you know, when the, they are uh, presented to us. So, yeah, the, the reader to me is most utmost important and so for all, you know, to the welfare of our company. And we do pride in, 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 uh, and consider them, you know, very, very instrumental, you know, in our continuing publications. Okay. And of course, the obligatory last question. Um, anything, any advice you'd give for somebody trying to get in? <laughs> well, like I said, you know, never give up, never surrender. That's the <laughs> most important thing I can give you because, you know, like I said, if you produce nothing, no one will ever see, you know, what you're capable of. So the best thing you do is just sit down and get to uh, the act of doing something. You know, it, it, so many, it's one thing to have an idea bottled in your head. It's another thing to unleash it, you know, onto the world. But the only way to do that is to actually produce something. And that's, that's, it's, that's the matter of, that's really what it comes down to. So even if, uh, 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 even if you don't think your work is ready, at least you're doing something, you know, at least you're getting it out there, you know, and uh, hopefully somebody will decide that this is the kind of material we want and give you that chance, you know, to break into the business. You know, but like I said before, uh, there's plenty of opportunity for uh, you to uh, do things on your own as well. You know, so uh, I all you have to do is just start somewhere. The journey of a thousand miles starts with that first step. So you just got to do it. Take that plunge. Cool. Anything? You, anything you'd like to plug? Uh, well, uh, like I said, I'm, I'm editing Planet Comics and Jungle Comics. I am working on the revival of Ninja High School. I do. Uh, I am also working on a book called Science uh, is Magic. And uh, basically, uh, I encourage anyone who wants to submit something to uh, uh, go to our Antarctic Press Dallas Facebook page and ask for guidelines to our various anthologies. I'll be happy to send them out to anyone who wants them. Cool. So here's hoping our uh, Warrior Nun does well later on this year. Oh, I know it'll do well. I feel very confident. From what I've seen, I think people are going to be blown away by it. Cool. So anyway, so that's our interview with Ben Dunn, editor over at uh, Antarctic Press. Please feel Thank free. you very much. Thank you. And please feel free to support the uh, – please feel free to support – the podcast over at patreon.com slash two sparrows, T-W-O, and I'll talk to you later. Have a good night.